Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have had some time now to go through the Too Many Bones Undertow rulebook and to get a couple games in. And so I'm gonna do my best here uh, in the shortest amount of time possible, cover the basic rules for you um, so you could get a, a general understanding of how the gameplay works. And if you are somebody who's joining a buddy who you know, already has the games, already familiar with it, knows how to set it up, this would be a great video to watch for you um, just to get a, a general idea and then your buddy can help walk you through it. But again, um, this is Undertow, uh, Too Many Bones Undertow. And we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna try and make this as brief as possible. So what you're looking at right now is your player board. You're referred to as a gear lock. Um, that's these kind of creatures here. And it just so happens that this gear lock has a companion, a wolf companion named Nightshade. So uh, she's got her own disc there uh, and duster. She is um, set up here with her full HP. Now this is kind of set up midway through a campaign. So I've actually unlocked some dice, um, raised my stats. Normally you would just, you know, start with these empty, um, things like that. Um, all of these empty. And what this essentially is showing you are the skills you can use and also the amount of attack and defense dice you can roll. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. This is the amount of chips, uh, health chips that go underneath your player when you are fully healed. So you always start with three. This person always starts with three. And then you can increase your stats as you go along. Um, and so you can see I have a starting health of six. Dexterity is how many dice and or movement you can take uh, on a given turn. So on a given turn, you could say move up to three spaces on the battle mat and then roll two dice. Or if you're already in position, you can roll five dice. Um, it's entirely up to you. The attack is how many of these plain white dice you can roll. And these don't exhaust or anything like that. They're not one-time use things, but you can only roll up to the amount you see in front of you. So I can roll up to three at a time. Your defense dice um, down here is pretty much the same thing, except for when you roll your defense dice, if say you roll a shield, you would place it on top of your character uh, to represent that that shield's there. So now if I already have one die out here, I essentially can only roll one, actually two more. Um, you know, or if I had three on here, say like this, I could not roll defense dice uh, until some of these get used up. Um, anytime you roll a bone, so there's technically no misses in this game, um, but if you were to roll, uh, say that, that's a two attack or a one shield, but if you were to roll this, it's nothing you can use this turn, but they do get slotted into what's called your backup plan. And you can see that at each level, uh, except for the fifth level for this person, there is something you can do to use up these bones. You shift everything down to the left, but you could use what's called backstab that if, you know, Nightshade and you are both on the thing and you've got somebody in between you, you can attack someone for two true damage, um, pull these off, add them back uh, into your dice pool. If you have dice here, they don't count against um, your total dice count um, like they are up here. Uh, only shields sitting on your person. These last dice down here represent your skills that you can use. And these are kind of like one time use, um, either instant use or roll them and store them away up here type of use. And you can see that one of them actually represents Nightshade's initiative die, just like you have an initiative die. So you would roll this into battle um, beforehand. Um, Nightshade has her own specific rules. I'm not gonna really go into those right now, but you can see Nightshade has her own little track here on the bottom. And this die actually gets used by Nightshade. It puts a times two damage on um, one particular baddie. And what you do essentially is using your up to your dexterity, you would roll these in and some of them have to be used immediately, like these two attack dice. This would be hitting your baddie for five right there. And then this bottled smoke um, is like a you know ninja effect that you have now and you have it at your disposal. See, there is a bone on here that you could roll and then you would stick it in here. Um, but when you roll this die, 
instead of using it immediately, you can actually tuck this one away. Same with this one. You could go ahead and roll this one, even if Nightshade's not on the battle mat. But then when Nightshade comes on, you are instantly ready to put this on a baddie and it marks them as Nightshade's prey. Um, and she gets times two damage against that baddie. And this one you would pull off at any point in time and exhaust it. All your exhausted dice go over here and you would become untargetable for a turn. And when you use these up, they don't go back into here until the end of the battle. So these are kind of like one time use um, of events per se, uh, your skills are. Um, there may be some skills or some treasure, some loot cards that allow you to bring them back, but essentially you gotta figure out when you wanna use them in battle when the opportune time is. The last thing I wanted to point out over here is just some loot. Um, you gain this by completing scenarios successfully and um, they just kind of sit over here. Like this one allows you to um, uh, heal yourself some. This allows you to heal yourself one HP at the start of each turn, which is really nice. This one actually increases your dex by one, which was this. Uh, so you can see my dexterity was this, and I was only rolling four die until I obtained the loose wires. Now, if I were to ever discard this because I wanted something better in its spot, because you can only have four loot at a given time, um, I would have to go back down to four dexterity. Um, and this last one is trove loot, which means it's locked. And I'm not gonna go into the whole lock picking thing, but um, as you can see here, these are all the dice just for Duster, you know, some general attack dice, wipe it, but this is all her other dice that would fit in right here. But you can see there are these lock die right here that have the, um, the trip, the force, the lever symbols, and then this die that allows you to like reroll. And basically you're rolling all four of these every time and trying to unlock your loot um, in between encounters. Um, these little lines off to the side line up with these pips. This would mean I have one lock unlocked uh, if I fail halfway through. This would mean I have the first two locks unlocked and then I'm only going for the fifth one. Um, if I have it tucked up here, that means I haven't made any attempts. I haven't unlocked any of the three locks. So you don't have to get all three of them successfully in, in one turn. Um, but that's it. Um, you know, these dice are unique to your person. So um, Stanza, the other character who's right here, uh, she has her own set of dice. Any other players in the Too Many Bones universe that you would bring in would have their own dice. Um, she has innate abilities. Um, her backup plan and all this is all described on this very detailed um, sheet here that you can see it's got even like the sides of the dice so you can know what your odds are it explains what all the dice icons mean on the back it describes her backup plan and uh, critical details you definitely want to read this before you would play with them for the first time uh, status effects what their innate skill is so i mean everything you need to know is on this sheet it does look very daunting um but you you learn this stuff pretty quickly um what is um uh i'll show you guys in a second is the um baddie encounter sheet which is um just as big so i'm going to take a second here and i'm going to switch over to the uh, battle mat and we're going to show you baddies and a battle example all right guys so this is um what the battle mat looks like an undertow was unique in the fact that it actually has a double-sided battle mat i'm just going to curl this over a little bit whoops um you can kind of see there that the other side's more of a earth um you know your basic ground battle but this is a raft battle which means there's water on all sides and you kind of got to stay you're trapped in the middle of the the raft here um these this in particular baddie you can see actually is starting in the water they are what's called the krellen or a krellen baddie this one's a krellen water wraith um they start in the water and always stay in the water so they're gonna kind of duck under the raft and pop up in various places but they're always going to be here on the outside edges so you are safe in the middle um, but if you don't tend to them if they don't have anybody to attack they actually will damage your raft um, and so they will attack the raft and if the attack is successful they will start damaging the raft here um, and if you ever have five damage to the raft 
you lose the encounter. Uh, so that is unique to Undertow. But essentially what um, I did was, based on the encounter here, I just kind of made this one up, but say an encounter said to um, start build your battle queue, you would need to include at least one Krellin and then two level one baddies. Uh, you can see these guys are, are point, one point baddies. Uh, the Krellins are three, um, but the encounter card tells you all that. You always would start with Krellins. So he came in at position one and I just randomly rolled a D6 to put him there. Now these guys came in and you can see this guy was the next guy up. He got a two and he, I don't know if you can see it way down there, but he is a, uh, a ranged attacker. So you would look for two in row two and ranged would start here. And if he was melee, he would have started down here. And this guy's the opposite. He is melee. He came in in position three. And so he goes here. If he had also been ranged, he would have been down here. So it kind of spreads him out. Um, the other side of the mat is more ranged and or ranged in the back, melee in the front. Looks like a more standard battle. You can also see here I have the, the little red number here is the amount of health chips I put underneath them. And the green number underneath is the um, initiative die that I've set for them. So even though this guy came in first, he's actually at a three and he's at the end of the initiative here. These two guys are tied, so this guy came in second, so I stuck him behind him. And now at this point, I have to roll my die in to see where I go. Now I rolled a four, and I always get to jump ahead of anybody I'm tied with. If I had rolled a three, for example, I would have been right here. And these two guys would have gotten a turn before I even went. Um, but I rolled a four, so we're gonna go right here, and you can see this is just a round tracker. Um, it's kind of like a timer on the battle because once you get to five, after five is six and you're stuck on these rounds where everybody takes a true damage um, at the beginning of the round. So, um, you know, it, it makes it so that the rounds don't or the battles don't last forever. One of the nice things about Nightshade, or not, not Nightshade, Duster here is that it, her innate ability is that she can start anywhere on the battle mat. Otherwise, um, she would have had to, well, it makes more of a difference on the other side because she would have been stuck to these two bottom rows. But I could start her over here and be, you know, I could start her way over here and be far away from anybody. But that also means that I'd have to use up all my dexterity just to get up here and, and make a move. Um, if, however, I was tucked away back here, maybe that's what I would want to do and make them come to me first. Or maybe I want to start here so that this guy doesn't beat up the raft um, because I'm not around. So again, your starting position, and she is lucky because she gets to just start anywhere, so she could start here. Um, other gear locks have to follow uh, different rules, but essentially, um, you know, you would say put yourself here, and I'm not going to worry about this person right now, and. Um, then you have to make a decision. You're gonna decide, all right, if I started here, I've got five dice I can roll. I don't, I'm not gonna use my dexterity for any movement. So I could roll, say, um, you know, three and two, or say I'm planning on Nightshade coming in very soon. Uh, so I would wanna go ahead and roll that. Maybe I wanna go ahead and get this guy bleeding. So I would put Duster's Dagger in there. And so essentially I just roll whatever five dice I want to roll them and play out the results. Um, you know, some of them I have to use immediately, something like this I would put on top, this I would store away, like I said, in the active slot. Um, the thing with Nightshade is that she's kind of like a, a guardian companion. She doesn't always, she only shows up if Duster's hurting. Um, so you actually have to take some damage or start the encounter with less than full HP if you want uh, Nightshade to start on the battle mat with you. So she only comes into play kind of to protect Duster um, when, when she's not doing so good or when she's hurting, essentially. She's like a mama wolf. Um, but you can see that, say I was over here, baddies are pretty straightforward. They're always going to get two movement if they need to, and then they're going to roll. This guy would roll a one attack die and a one defense die. And if he rolls a bone, he actually does this careless stat. Uh, he also has a detonate two. Um, this guy, as a ranged one, would always roll 
uh, attack that against me no matter where he is. He actually is just going to stay put, ranged, people don't move unless they're forced to for some reason. Um, but again, all of these have these uh, words, poison, detonate two, careless one, untargetable. That's where your other cheat sheet comes in handy. And you can see this and it says batty skills and encounter terms. And this one um, is quite wordy. Um, you definitely want to keep it handy. I reference it literally every battle several times um, because I it just it's going to take a long time to learn what everything means. On the back side, you can see like your guide to recovery, what your options are. This is the lock picking rules. Uh, they're also in the in the rule book, but to keep them handy here, how you can use your training points, things like that. So that's it, essentially. Um, not all of your encounters make use of a battle. Sometimes there's little mini games that they have you play using the battle map. Other times it's a true battle. Other times it's a lock picking event. Other times it's just make a decision. Um, but either way, you make use of, um, you know, your, your victory points and things like that, that from each encounter to upgrade your person like an RPG um, and as the um, as the uh, your little campaign goes on you can see that there's this day counter um, that ticks up and this is how your baddies are determined that uh, as a solo player you would just take the number of days and that's your baddie points so you can see here I've got like a five five point baddies and one point baddies so this would be what I would fight on day six um, there's even a 20 point baddie here um, for the big ones. Um, usually these guys don't come into play unless you are specifically being asked to bring in um, a nasty guy. Or if you're playing with two players, you would take this number and you would times it by two. So you may be on day 10 of a really long campaign. Two players would be at one 20 point baddie. Um, so, and those are, you know, all the baddies are these really nice heavy poker chips. Um, everything's essentially either poker chips or dice or cards. Um, you know, there's no miniatures, there's no other fiddly things to deal with. So it's very clean, um, very straightforward. Um, I, I feel like it's a lot of fun. You know, I feel like, uh, I'm on playing Texas Hold'em, moving around these poker chips on and off the board as people take damage and things like that. So I've really enjoyed it so far. It is a tough game. Um, takes a lot of strategy to figure out how to work around the battle, especially as a solo player. I've um, believe that it's probably even more difficult playing solo um, just because there's only one of you and, and you can't just rush in there and, and take all the damage. Duster is certainly not a tank character. So again, this was just to cover the basic rules. This was not going into setup. This was not going into strategy. This was not going into detailed rules like lock picking. But hopefully this uh, gives you just a general idea of what Undertow looks like and plays like out of the box. And um, if you would ever consider purchasing it from Chip Theory Games, um, this may give you just a, a heads up as to what you're getting yourself into. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I check those regularly. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you wanna see more videos like this, please consider subscribing to the channel. Again, have a great day and I'll see you again next time.